from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Welcome to Middle East Focus. I'm Alistair Taylor, and the Eyes Editorial Director. Today, we're going to be talking about Iraq and discussing the new government, the security situation, and the issue of internally displaced persons, relations between Baghdad and Erbil, the aftermath of the 2017 referendum, and regional dynamics. I'm joined today by Zimkin Ali and Max Skelton, both of whom are affiliated with the Institute of Regional and International Studies, or IRIS, at the American University of Iraq Soleimani. Zimkin is a research fellow with IRIS and teaches in the College of Political Science at the University of Soleimani. His work focuses on ethno-sectarianism and the role of non-state actors and transnational groups in Iraq. Mac is the Director of Research and Policy at IRIS, and his work centers on the displacement and migration politics. Thank you both for joining me today. Good to be here. Yeah, glad to be here. So, okay, let's start with you. The cabinet is still in the process of being finalized following last year's elections, but what's your outlook on the prospects for the new government in Baghdad under Prime Minister Abdel Abdel Mahdi? Um, right. Um, we, we, first of all, we need to remember that um, um, Iraqi government has got many, many challenges um, to face in the coming years. Um, security, IDPs, um, responding to uh, people's demands for uh, better services, employment. So um, being a compromise candidate, I would say he has been doing quite well in terms of trying to form the government, as you uh, alluded to, the government is not formed entirely yet, but he seems to be, Dr. Adel Abdel Mahdi seems to be positioning himself in ways that he's ready to face these challenges. But again, he's a compromise. He needs any initiative, any policy towards solving or facing these challenges. He needs to um, negotiate um, with Iraqi stakeholders with the political parties. Uh, so I would say he's been doing very well in terms of trying to reestablish a uh, relationship with the KRG. He will be uh, working on um, issues of corruption that people are really angry about the population of Iraq. And provided that the oil prices will be stable in the next year or so, um, he's um, promised to um, help uh, return the IDPs and provide better security for, for the areas that previously affected by Iraq. But having said that, this note of optimism, there are many, many challenges that the new government need to face. And we'll, we'll have to give it some time to see whether it's up to the job or not. I wanted to ask next about the, the new president, Baram Saleh. Uh, there was a dispute uh, between uh, the Patriotic Union of Kurdistan and the Kurdistan Democratic Party with both putting up uh, different candidates for that office before they eventually settled on him. What does the choice of, of Saleh say about the state of Kurdish politics and kind of dynamics within Kurdistan? He's in a position that he needs to represent all Iraqis. He's now working in order to present a, a new face for Iraq. Um, he's been quiet and not very active in terms of Kurdish politics because he doesn't want to be accused of being a Kurdish president of Iraq. He wants to be seen and, as an Iraqi president. But this doesn't mean that he will not be doing his best in order to work to bring about better relationship between Baghdad and Erbil. And he's been working... Uh, particularly to solve the issue of Kirkuk, which is the, the, the most significant part of the disputed territories. I'd jump in and say that in terms of, you know, internal Kurdish politics, we really are at a, at a new chapter where, you know, the, the whole sort of KDP, P PUK, uh, at least nominally unified front in Baghdad is, is, is really broken down. Uh, and the battle over the presidency not only showed that, but also um, it, 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 on the more sort of optimistic side, it uh, revealed that uh, many of the MPs who are young and who are uh, first-time office holders were willing to break from their political parties to um, go for a candidate that they thought uh, represented uh, Iraq. Uh, and its sort of national interests. But in terms of the inner Kurdish issue, I, I think we really are at a, at a different point. 
Yeah, I, I do agree about that. But um, the question was about what kind of role he plays into the Kurdish politics. He has not been focusing on that. We would come to, to a point to discuss what is happening in Kurdistan and how that um, the issue of, of Kirkuk and Barham Saleh and uh, the others, how they complicate the Kurdish politics and deepen the division between the two main political parties in here. But as far as I could see, Barham Saleh has been less active in Kurdish politics, and it's been focusing on the center on Iraq. I wanted to ask next about the kind of broader baghdad Erbil relations. How have they changed the government, the new government, or is it kind of too soon to tell? There has been sort of talk of a, you know, a rapprochement uh, between Erbil and Baghdad. I think it is, and that conversation has a number of different centers of gravity. One of them has been this whole idea of uh, Barzani and, you know, uh, the prime minister uh, being on good terms and talking and and all of that. I'm one to think, uh, to be skeptical that the KDP is ultimately interested in a kind of fundamental improvement of relations and that some of this rhetoric may not have a whole lot to it. However, I think, on the other hand, President Salas being in office, uh, even though he comes from the weaker Kurdish political party, he is a source of potential uh, better relations. But on, on the KDP side, I think it's slightly less clear if this rhetoric is actually substantive. The relationship, uh, we all know, going back to the, the aftermath of the referendum and the backlash on the KRG from the Iraqi government and the way the Iraqi government actually uh, penalized the KRG by stopping oil flow through Kirkuk to, to, to Turkey, it actually, going back to track um, the relationship. So now the, the, the roads between Erbil and Kirkuk is open. Salaries are paid by the Iraqi government. There are meetings on high level between the, the two sides. But I still agree with Mark that to talk about a better relationship or putting back the relationship between Baghdad, uh, normalizing this relationship requires tackling the chronic issues that destabilize the relationship between Baghdad and Erbil, including the status of the disputed territories, the sharing or, of oil revenues, and the status of Kurdish forces at Peshmerga. None of these issues have been negotiated seriously over. So this takes me back to the main question, is Adel Abdel Mahdi ready to approach the Kurds and provide them with the kind of framework that they are thinking of, that remaining in Iraq, not thinking about leaving Iraq again, not destabilizing Iraq again, not talking about threatening the territorial integrity of Iraq, would Adel Abdel Mahdi be able to put on the table a comprehensive plan or roadmap for solving all the outstanding problems. I am aware that there are stakeholders in Baghdad beyond Adel Abdul Mahdi that they want actually to solve the problem of disputed territories. There, there is an agreement on sharing revenues, but this is temporary. This needs to be put into a legal framework and on a permanent basis. So revenue sharing from the disputed territories specifically? Yes. It needs to go towards the disputed territories. Before talking about solving the disputed territories, Baghdad and Erbil need to find a formula, a permanent one, on sharing oil resources, on sharing petroleum resources of Iraq. So this would be the first step towards solving the issue of disputed territories. Right. And I think one additional point on this disputed territories, which Zim Ken and I have been looking into a lot. Um, lately has been that in the aftermath of the referendum, when the GOI ostensibly took control over all of the uh, dis disputed areas, this taking over was actually quite a fragmented event. And the forces that moved in the disputed territories were a mixture of Badr PMFs, uh, Asaib Ahl al-Haq, uh, any number of other local ethnic militias uh, that are connected to the PMF umbrella. And so administratively, the disputed territories are so fractured right now that to say that the GOI is really even able to uh, sort of dictate what is going on there and to put things on the table that are coherent to the KRG is limited now. 
Uh, and so really the GOI and the, the prime minister needs to move quickly if there's going to be progress in those areas. What do you see the way forward being then for that, that bringing that kind of patchwork of PMF control under, under the central control of, of Baghdad? This is a central question that is being debated right now under the, the umbrella of security sector reform. What will happen to the PMF? I, I don't have any answers there. Uh, I think as it relates to the disputed territories, certainly because the PMFs are such a big part of the equation, uh, and for many other reasons, we are no longer in an era where we can kind of use Article 140 as, as a framework for these areas. It's too complex. We're at a different sort of standpoint. For our listeners that don't know what that is, could you just quickly clarify? Sure. Article 140 is an article, a uh, constitutional article, that was supposed to dictate that the disputed territories of Iraq would have referenda which would determine their final status. Those referenda never happened. And for many years, the disputed territories have been, from a legal standpoint, just sort of stagnant. And so going forward, resolving all the different issues, whether it's security, the PMFs, um, you know, who will administer these areas, it has to be under a new kind of roadmap that doesn't just kind of regurgitate that article. I think it's not just a question of Iraqi government making the move. The status of the disputed territories and finding a solution for it is being complicated by the intra-Kurdish divisions. Right now, we had election three months ago in the Kurdish region, and there's no government yet. And the government formation is actually com has been complicated and delayed by the fact that both the KDB and the PUK are accusing each other of losing Kirkuk to the Iraqi government after the referendum. To form a government, the PUK says that the Kirkuk issue needs to be solved first. And the issue is that PUK is very popular and powerful, and they need to put a governor, a PUK-affiliated governor, back to Kirkuk. And Kirkuk is the oil-rich city, and it's the most significant part of the disputed territories. So for a PUK governor to be back in Kirkuk, KDP needs to agree on this and ask its KDP governor, provincial members to go back to Kirkuk and vote for this PUK uh, governor to be back in office. The KDP doesn't want to do that. The PUK doesn't want to go ahead with forming a Kurdish government because KDP refuses to have a PUK governor back in Kirkuk. So imagine if they cannot agree on putting back a Kurdish governor, how come they will develop a unified platform through which they can negotiate with Baghdad? Right. So both sides are undergoing this kind of political and security fragmentation that makes any kind of grand negotiations very difficult. I wanted to ask about the security situation writ large within Iraq as well as within uh, northern Iraq, Kurdistan specifically. Where do things stand now and how much of a concern is there about a potential resurgence of ISIS? I believe and I, I think Zimkin would concur that the uh, reports of a kind of resurgence of ISIS are overblown. That, uh, you know, sometimes you will see maps that would suggest that ISIS still has you know, massive influence over large swaths of Iraq. That is inaccurate. ISIS is not popular in the areas that it formerly controlled. That doesn't mean that security is not a major challenge for many reasons. Uh, one, one issue that you see for reasons that we've already alluded to is that, for instance, in an area like Nineveh Plains, each different town area has a different PMF. They don't all get along. They do have disagreements. And the security framework for those areas is just frankly incoherent. And so I think that's a major issue. But Zim Kin is also, he's done a lot of research in areas of northern Diyala. That is one of the areas where you could argue that ISIS has some insurgent potential. And so you probably have some, some thoughts there, Zim Kin. Yeah, so I generally agree with Mark that a research in ISIS soon or the possibility of it coming back suddenly is not something that I believe in. But 
the Sunni areas in Iraq, I think the government and the government security forces need to make sure that the population there are integrated, are happier under the Iraqi government than another group like ISIS. ISIS being weakened, the popular basis for such kind of rhetoric is not there. The population around um, Mosul, Salahuddin, Diyala are very tired of war, mostly lost their properties, their livelihood, their dear ones. So some of them still live in camps. So I do not really think they want to support any form of radical Sunni groups such as ISIS. But again, if the government fails to develop those areas, uh, respond to people's demands for services, for jobs, for inclusiveness, then I wouldn't cast out a possibility in the long term of resurgence of insurgencies in different forms. Sure. If not ISIS, perhaps some other group that harnesses the similar sentiment. Sure. Mm-hmm. I wanted to ask, and this is something you just touched on, Zimkin, now, the, the issue of people that are still in camps. Uh, according to the UN, there are still around 2 million IDPs in Iraq as of the end of last year. Are we likely to see more displaced Iraqis returning home this year, Mac? The camp issue is going to be one of the biggest thorns in the side of this, uh, this new government. There are logistical issues. There are funding issues. There's been some efforts to uh, consolidate these camps. One of the major issues is that for a lot of these camps, they're kind of in an ambiguous status, somewhere between a camp and you could say a, a prison in, in a way, because a lot of the problems that are you know, at the center of this is this sort of idea of the ISIS family, the, the family that is in some way uh, connected to an ISIS member. Guilt by association. Exactly. What will be done with those families and how they are to be treated legally and from a humanitarian standpoint is still in the air. In terms of return home, there are areas of Iraq where it is very clear that the policy is that the families that were evacuated from those areas will not return ever. Areas like Jurafa Sakhar, some areas north of Baghdad. These are areas, by and large, where there have been long-standing sectarian tensions and the ISIS campaign exacerbated them further. What will become of those families, nobody really knows. There is a national reconciliation committee that has been doing work and has resettled some of these families or some of these areas. But what will become of the ones that are essentially thought of as no return areas is up in the air. I wanted to add to what Mark just said, is that government corruption. So on the provincial level, the government has been really irresponsive, squandering, wasting money dedicated to dealing with IDPs. So we had issues in Kirkuk. There were many Arabs, IDPs from areas around Kirkuk, and money was dedicated to deal with these IDPs to rebuild their houses, to create jobs for them. But then the current governor was one of those that was accused of wasting the money and taking the money, using the money for private interest. The first question is that how the new government, its success or failure will depend on how it will deal with the issue of corruption in the center and on the level of the governor rates. Simkin, I wanted to ask you about the referendum, the 2017 referendum on independence. Nearly a year and a half out, where do you think stand on that front? And given everything that's happened, is it safe to say that that idea is kind of on ice for the foreseeable future? Oh, yeah, I agree. The KRG, the, the leadership largely here, they realized that even though the Iraqi government is weak um, in its, their, their ability to control the whole Iraqi territory is quite weak. But the region, Iran, Turkey, even the Kurdish allies in the West are not happy with the Kurds breaking from Iraq. They understand this, and it needs another generation to come out with a different approach to trying to 
make peace with the state of Iraq and coming up with a general framework that with a roadmap that Iraq, Kurds and Arab can share Iraq. But again, it all depends on the way in which Baghdad will from now on respond to the Kurdish concerns and the, the Kurdish demands for sharing oil, for the status of the disputed territories. The more responsive the Iraqi government is, the more chance there is for the Kurds to understand that living within Iraq is much better than thinking about creating a Kurdish state which is not acceptable to the regional states and to the international community at large. Mac, any final, final thoughts? Where do you see things going from here? Well, I think there needs to be a more serious conversation connected to the long-term plan for reconstructing the post-ISIS areas. Of course, it's a political question, but if you go to places like the center of Mosul, you go to a lot of the disputed territories, there is a sense that there's really no movement. And so if you want to connect this back to the question of IDPs, in a lot of, especially the disputed territories, you show up and, and you see that, okay, we have promising return numbers, but they're starting to stagnate. Why is that? Because the kind of small reconstruction that you can do, you know, to your home, to your kind of personal property, we've gotten to the end of that. People have done that. But now you need a large-scale infrastructure. You need, you need the state, essentially, to be acting, to be paying private contractors that have not received a pavement in years uh, so that they will start their projects. And so unless that happens, unless the state is willing to make investment spending, to have an actual investment budget, I think this discontent that you are seeing both in Basra and in the north will continue. That will have to be the final word. Zimkin, Mac, thank you both for joining us today. Pleasure. It was a pleasure. Thank you. And thank you as well to our audience for listening in and to my colleague Scott for producing today's program. We will see you all next week. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.